let's turn our attention to the NFL draft. We're going to get some answers in 10 days from now, but between now and then, let's talk with one of the Mavens who looks at all the film and breaks it all down from NFL Films, a longtime producer, the senior producer of NFL Films, our friend Greg Cosell. It's been a while. How are you, Greg? Rich, good to see you. It's been a bit. It's been a bit. Now, behind you, I see on your on your uh, bulletin board there, are those um, – uh, I, I haven't seen this before. Are, are, are those Steve Sable cards that are tacked up to the board behind you? Oh, sort of, sort of. Yeah, they're, what they're cards. They? Yeah. What are those? Are they? Are they? Are uh, they well, uh, they're some of them are just. Uh, uh, I probably shouldn't have them up. Some of oh. them are. Uh, like personal things, but oh, okay. yeah, they're fun. sorry to call attention to it then, Greg. My bad. My no, bad. no, you probably don't want no, to. because <laughs> they look like they look like Steve Sable index cards that he would have. You oh, know, well, he, he would write down you know, sayings, that and that was, that's what it looks like to me. Uh, you know, yeah, I've well, seen he, some of them. Oh yeah, as you know, he, they, his office was full of that. And uh, can you believe it's been about ten years, Rich? That's I can't crazy. believe it. Just before before we go, I, I you know I'm I'm kind of throwing your curveball here, but when did you meet Steve Sable? How did the first meeting between Greg Cosell and a member of the Sable family go? If it was Steve, well, I or applied Ed? to NFL Films in, in July of 1979 or June of '79, and I got a call from Ed Sable asking me to come in for an interview. I came in for an interview, and um, <clears throat> I did not meet uh, Steve at that point. And about a week after the interview, I got a call back from Ed Sable saying they wanted to hire me. And I started working for NFL Films on July 23rd, 1979. And uh, any Facenda moments for you? Oh, uh, I worked with, yeah, I worked with John quite a bit. I, in fact, unfortunately, I was the last one to work with him before he passed. Okay. So which quarterback available in the draft throws the perfect NFL film spiral, Greg? No. <laughs> oh, the perfect one. Wow. Probably Michael Penix. Right. I thought the same thing yeah. when I saw him at the combine and we were zooming in on it. And I'm like, OK, uh, to use a phrase that Facenda would say when uh, when when he got a good piece of copy, uh, like that's a horse you can ride. You know what it's I'm a saying? Horse like, you can ride. I'm <laughs> that's, a, that's good. You remember all that oh, stuff. Oh, sure. Rich. Oh, good sure. For you. I thought like, you know, you can you know, you and your, your I mean, your colleagues with uh, who are just masters at this can really zoom in on that Penix ball. Right. He throws the tightest oh, spiral. Would you say? Oh. Right. Yeah, he throws a really tight spiral. And it, it actually showed up at the Combine as well, but it certainly shows up on tape. So what is your analysis of Michael Penix? Let's start with him. Well, before we just do that, I, I think we need to understand everybody wants a bold answer to these kinds of things. Right. You know, who do you like? Who's going to be a star? We have to understand a number of things. Number one, nobody's a finished product when they come into the NFL. There's all projection as involved in this as well. Mm -hmm. No one comes in where you say that guy's a definite. I mean, just think back. What is it? Three years ago when they used the term generational with Trevor Lawrence. Right. And nothing against Trevor Lawrence, who I think is a solid NFL quarterback. But I think we have to be careful about making these bold, definitive statements. Um, so getting to Penix. Um, one thing I really enjoyed about watching Penix is that offense under Ryan Grubb, who, as you know, is now the offensive coordinator for Seattle. It was very sort of intermediate and vertically based. So you saw a lot of difficult intermediate and deep throws in that offense. Um, and he's a he's very accountable to the system. He wanted the system to work. He let it play out. He did not leave the pocket. And the thing that went along with that, which is really impressive, is he rarely got sat, which means he was getting rid of the football. He was not just waiting and waiting. So that tells you that he knew where to go with the ball. He understood the route concepts. He understood what he was seeing because he didn't get stuck in the pocket, Rich. Yeah, I mean, the processing that Penix yep. has has shown, um, I think, is first rate. I, I really do. And, and, and as a Michigan Wolverine fan, um, you know, I was concerned about that going into the national championship game, that his neck up ability is really good. But then, you know, some of the evaluations and evaluators that I've had uh, on this show about that national championship game is that Michigan threw as much of an NFL defense at Penix that he'd ever seen, and they kind of had him off stride. So I'm and wondering where you stand degree. on that subject matter. Yeah, Greg. they did to some degree. They also had a ton of, of uh, false start penalties in that game that put them into really too many long yardage situations. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to play against any defense, but certainly a Michigan defense that had what eight or nine defenders at the combine and probably all of them will be drafted. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily a believer in one game. I think when I start the evaluation process, I, I start, as I think most guys do, with traits and attributes. Uh, then I think about the offense that they're asked to run. Is uh, Am I seeing things that I'm likely to see at the NFL level? Is he being asked to some degree to do things that he'll be asked to do in the NFL? And then you start thinking about projection. You start thinking, okay, what kind of offense would he best be able to, to, to work within? So th- the project, projection part is where it becomes, you know, pretty difficult. It's e- the easy part very often, Rich, is to look at a quarterback and say, boy, he's really talented. No one's going to argue that Caleb Williams isn't talented. That's not the point. That's the easy part of the evaluation. Then you have to go further. Look, I mentioned Trevor Lawrence. He was generational, as, as we all recall. It hasn't quite worked out that way, and it may still, maybe in a year or two, we'll say he's one of the two or three best in the league. But generational is one of those terms that goes well beyond just being one of the two or three best. So I, I think you have to factor in a lot of variables when you evaluate quarterbacks. It's not just an easy mathematical equation. Greg Cosell from NFL Films here on the Rich Eisen Show. So then, um, assuming, and I think rightfully so, that Caleb Williams goes to Chicago, yeah. when you're talking about scheme fits and you're talking about uh, the proper fits for the traits that you see on tape from college, which quarterback that's still available, minus Caleb Williams, do you think best fits Cliff Kingsbury's system and the Washington Commanders roster as we currently know it. Which one do you think is the best fit there, Greg? I mean, Drake Mays played in that system because two years ago in North Carolina, Phil Longo, who runs an air raid system, who was the North Carolina offensive coordinator two years ago, when many believed that Drake May had a better season than he did this past year, he's been in that system. So he understands it. He knows the methodology. He knows how it's taught. He knows the concepts. So he would probably not have a, a a problem really stepping right in and understanding at least w- what he's asked to do. That doesn't mean you execute it at a high level. Sure. It's obviously a different level of football. Um, I would think Jaden Daniels could execute that system effectively. Um, you know, certainly there's a run element that Jaden Daniels gives you, although he's, he's not just a runner. Some might think he is because he's so dynamic, but he stays in the pocket. The running is, is his parachute. It's the last thing he looks to do. Um, but, you know, I think that both those guys in an ideal world would fit. I think both of them will have um, s- some learning to do because the game will be different. The game will be faster. Um, so, uh, and and that's the thing, you know, you never know exactly how long the learning curve takes. The one thing about the air raid offense um, is these guys aren't really taught much about defenses. And one advantage Drake May had this past season in North Carolina is Clyde Christensen was there essentially coaching him. And as you know, Clyde Christensen coached in the NFL for a long time. Mm -hmm. He coached Andrew Luck. He coached Tom Brady. He coached Peyton Manning. So I guarantee Drake May, and he's got some issues he has to work out as well, by the way, but Drake May probably has a better understanding of the process of how to go about playing the position because it all starts rich with the process. Yeah, and then the consensus that I've heard, too, from a lot of evaluators, Greg, is that May needs maybe more time to sit if you have the luxury and can afford that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if you already gave me the uh, the sort of head nod in a, in a way that thinks that, that, that that's not a certainty. But my question for you, then, is which one do you think that you've seen out of all the quarterbacks available is most pro-ready, that can step in based on the processing, based on the knowledge, based on you know, what you've seen on tape, Greg? Well, I'll answer it this way. I think that no one is theoretically pro ready because the the environment and the game is different. So I think when you talk to coaches, which I do a lot of at the combine, as you know, you know, I get to see you there on occasion. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things they always talk about is you sort of have to tailor what you do to what their strengths are, especially if they have to play early. So it's not so much being pro ready, it's taking what you believe they do really, really well and tailoring some of what you do offensively with your pass game to what they do so they're comfortable because they've got to play and and you want them to have some success. Now, do some quarterbacks come in and have great success? Yes, look at what C.J. Stroud did and now everybody thinks that, hey, every quarterback who's drafted high is going to come in and be C.J. Stroud. It's, it's like with, when coaches go from worst to first, every owner thinks that that's going to happen all the time. 
you know, so you have to be a little careful with that, but you tailor what you think they do best. So in other words, if a quarterback is mobile, you'd like to be in a situation where the, the quarterback run game is a factor, where the quarterback boot action pass game is a factor. You try to give him things that he's comfortable with and that help him see things clearly. The key thing is for the quarterback to see things clearly in a very short amount of time, Rich. So which one do you think has that skill set? Who? Yeah. That's a hard question. I mean, well, I only ask it, those, Greg. Now, I only now ask it comes them. down to how you structure your offense. I mean, you know, you could look at someone like Bo Nix, who's not going to be drafted in the top five, but Bo Nix played in a system that really defined things beautifully for him. He was a brilliant executor and ball distributor. Um, you know, I, I would bet that there are some coaches that look at Bo Nix and think that, hey, I have a system that is really effective. He can execute it at a pretty high level right now. Um, he's not as gifted a passer as some of the other guys. He doesn't have as big an arm. He's not a power thrower. You don't have to be a power thrower. Joe Burrow is certainly not a power thrower. And and I hope people understand I'm not making a direct comparison between Bo Nix and Joe Burrow. But, you know, arm strength is, is a relative term. Some people it's really important. Some people it's not. Think of it this way, Rich. If you talk to 15 different coordinators or, or quarterback coaches, they'll probably have the same 15 traits on their list of what's important, but it's the value they ascribe to specific traits. Some might ascribe higher value to a specific trait, others not so much. You know, it all depends on what value you ascribe based on how you see the game as a coach. What's your opinion of J.J. McCarthy, Greg? Um, I, I don't think the tape spoke to being a first round pick. Um, you know, I think that the system he played in, I'm sure it was pro based in terms of terminology and methodology. Um, you like to see things on tape that you feel you can extrapolate to the next level. You did not see a lot of that with JJ McCarthy, which again, doesn't mean he can't do it, Rich. Mm -hmm. It just means that you'd like to see it and you didn't. So now you, you look at him and Obviously, he's going to, you know, every quarterback goes out on a pro day and throws the ball nicely. I mean, it's it's shorts and a T-shirt. So um, I don't think he showed a particularly good arm on tape in Michigan. Um, I He played behind the best offensive line in college football. Receivers were open. Um, it was relatively easy for him. Um, I'm not necessarily a believer that he wasn't asked to do a lot because that's not on him. But it does matter when you think that, how do we evaluate a lot of these quarterbacks, Rich? If, if you're losing 27-17 in the fourth quarter and there's eight minutes to go and you have to drop back and pass literally every play, do we know if J.J. McCarthy can do that? Maybe he can. Uh, I'm sure you'd say we don't really know the answer to that based on what he did in college. Well, in terms of, in terms of your evaluation there, let's say a bunch of folks uh, in the top, say, 10 or 11 agree with you. That, that the tape doesn't say first round. Does he fit what Sean Payton does, Greg? Um, Probably. Okay. I mean, look, I think McCarthy at his core, and everybody is a system quarterback because that's what it, the way it's taught. Sure. Um, but it, that seems to have a negative uh, pejorative connotation, obviously, as you know. Um, but everybody is taught that way. Um, I think ultimately with J.J. McCarthy, you want him in a, in a system where the run game is a factor where personnel and formations really factor into the equation, um, where play action factors in. One thing he has done is he's turned his back to the defense with play action, and that's a learned trait. If you've never done that before, that's a little scary for a quarterback because when you turn your back to the defense and then turn your head back around, they're not in the same spot they were before you turned your head. So that's a learned trait, and he knows how to do that. That's something he has done. Um, but I think that the complementary nature of the way in which he played at Michigan is the way you'd like him to sort of get his feet wet in the league to start. Okay, before I let you go, Greg Cosell, uh, I don't know if this uh, – have I set a record for the longest interview uh, or the longest uh, a host conducting an interview with you has gone without – diving in on Caleb Williams yet? I mean, have I, have I set that <laughs> no, normally record? Normally he's the first guy that, that yeah. I'm asked about. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And I went Penix, yeah. you know, I kind of flipped yeah. it upside down on you. Yeah, Greg. I like it. I like it, Rich. So I like it. The, the You're way, a trendsetter. Uh, I'd like to think so. Um, <laughs> I have patches on my on my sweater, so. Right, right, um, right. So I'm in that sort of mood today. But <laughs> in uh, the, the question, how, how, this is how I'll term it. Uh, I'll, I'll approach it with you. What would be your counsel in expectation setting for Bears fans 
for Caleb Williams in his rookie season? Greg. Well, I'm going to answer it this way because I'm going to give you something that I don't think is talked about a lot with Caleb Williams. That I think is real positive. Um, everybody talks about, you know, the so-called Mahomes element. Okay. And let's put that aside because to use an educational term, it's really hard to major in Mahomes. He's just a special cat. And you don't want to start thinking that every quarterback that comes in the league is like Patrick Mahomes. Um, what I really like about Caleb Williams is he really controls the ball exceptionally well. And what I mean by that is he can place the ball exactly where he wants to place it. And sometimes I think that gets overlooked, Rich, because we focus so much on movement now because of the, Mah uh, the Mahomeses, because of the Josh Allens, the Lamar Jacksons, and I'm sure I'm missing some other names as well. Um, but we focus so much on that. And there's no question that Caleb Williams has that ability. We've seen it in college. But he really controls the football beautifully. And I think when all said and done, that's – may be the most critical piece because you can do everything right as a quarterback rich but if you can't throw it where you want to you don't really have anything and you think he's got that ability while also doing the off-platform stuff i do i okay. do i mean it's hard not to like caleb williams based on on tape i mean you know i'm not going to sit here and say he's the best quarterback i've seen in, in you know in 44 years of the NFL films, um, but he's certainly a high-level prospect. Um, and again, having said that, do I think he's going to come in and throw 40 touchdowns and five interceptions? Not likely, although he is going to go into a pretty good situation. Normally, a number one draft choice does not go into a situation quite like that. And I know a question I'm about to deliver is not usually the lane in which you thrive or like to drive, Greg, but do you agree with the assessment the Bears clearly made to send Justin Fields packing and choose this kid? Do you agree with it? I do. I do agree with it, yes. Why is that? Um, you know, I think Fields has played enough games. I believe he started 37 games in this league. And one of the things that I think that is just stands out, and it's very hard to coach this. Believe me, you've had these conversations. I've had these conversations. It's very hard to teach someone to see things clearly when they really don't just innately. And I think that's one of the major issues with Justin Fields that may never change. And if that doesn't change, he'll always be a spectacular player who can make special plays and will have special games, but may not just be exactly what you want at the quarterback position long term. And based on what you saw out of Russell Wilson last year on tape, Greg, if this is truly an open competition between these two gents when uh, the training camp hmm. opens in Pennsylvania in uh, august do you think it's uh it's a that fields has a shot at being a week one starter you think russell's gonna well, take the gig what do you think you know I, I, you know me rich i'm not a, a hot take guy yeah no. but i would think that based on the way mike tomlin talks anyway you know i've not had this conversation with him I actually think that because he wants to run the football and that's important to him, it seems to be anyway, doesn't it? Playing physical football, Heck yeah. doesn't that seem to be important to Mike Tomlin? Yeah. I would almost think that Justin Fields, because of the quarterback run game element, would actually give them a, a more diverse offense than with Russell Wilson. Neither Fields nor Wilson is a true timing rhythm passer. So – you know, Fields would give you more options offensively if he was the quarterback, if assuming that that's the way they want to play, if they want to run the ball with their two backs, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. If that's the way they want to play, you know, and, and be physical up front and establish that kind of offense, then Fields gives you more options. Well, listen, I know when, uh, when you talk about two-way threat quarterbacks, the name Ryan Tannehill is not usually the first couple of names out of somebody's mouth, but Arthur Smith yeah. had Derrick Henry and on Ryan Tannehill in the same yeah. offense, and they they – they look pretty damn good. <laughs> there were mean, a couple of years there. They were really good. I mean, right. they went to the AFC championship game. They averaged over 30 points a game that year. They almost yeah. beat the Chiefs. Right. I mean, no, you, no question. All right. Last one for you, Greg. You had mentioned C.J. Stroud earlier, and obviously that's who everybody's going to be trying to yeah. uh, strive for <laughs> when they choose a quarterback in 10 days in the first round. Um, so my question for you is, was Stroud the unicorn that we all thought he was looking at his tape? I mean, Kurt Warner saying, look at his tape. He was as good as anybody, veteran yep. or rookie, last year. It is He is, in fact, the real deal, Greg, for yeah, real? Well, he was, I mean, he was my number one quarterback, but I'm not going to sit here and nice. say, Rich, that I thought he'd be this good. I right. mean, you know, I mean, you know, I think I'm okay at doing this, but I'm not going to sit here and say I knew the answer to that. Right. Um, 
But I tell you what, he made some throws. I think it was week two last year. Okay, I'm watching tape because, you know, I watch tape every week, yep. grind away. And he made some throws in that game week two, whoever the opponent was, I can't even remember. And I just, you know, called in the guys uh, in our matchup room here at NFL Films and said, hey, look at the timing. Look at the anticipation. Look at when he's starting his delivery to throw this ball. He just saw it really, really clearly. Um, and that's a hard thing to teach. And he just saw it really clearly. And the the precise ball location that's what we sp I spoke about earlier just he's so precise and I actually thought his delivery was more compact a year ago with the Texans than it was his last year at Ohio State so yeah he was really really good yeah he he lost that game to the Colts and starting zero and two it's the only time he lost consecutive games last year um, he was yeah, that's right it was the Colts because now I can see the play in my mind yeah eye. yeah so what does year two look like for him do you think. What does that possibly well, look it, like here, Greg? It, it, I can't imagine it's, you know, again, let's not look at the number of interceptions. He could throw five more interceptions and have a better year. It, those are just numbers on a page. Right. And you have to look at the plays. Um, but obviously they're going to have three really good receivers because Dell will be back. Um, and uh, Nico Collins is a clear number one right now. Um, yeah. So they're going to have really good receivers. They have a good tight end. Yeah, they just um, added digs too. They just Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They'll have three really good receivers. Right. Um, um, so I, I can't imagine, you know, anything's going to be theoretically worse. And again, now you get into numbers and all that, but, but this kid's a special kid. I've gotten to meet him and know him a little bit. He's a special kid. Um, I, I he's going to be a really, really good player. He is now. Yeah. That's, that's the new, I would think standard on a draft night, a first round draft night. They want the you want the next CJ Stroud. That's what you want. And, and Rich, you and I both know mm -hmm. the Texans can say whatever they want now. They didn't know he'd be this good. Um, they liked him obviously, or they wouldn't have drafted him. Right. You know. You know. He was so so good. I mean, ridiculously good. Which is why, again, just to circle back to the beginning of the conversation, you 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 put out the caveat of of the so yeah. many different parts of an evaluation, and uh, and then some of it is, is let's see what happens when uh, Toe meets ball in an actual playing season. Greg, I appreciate the time. As always, we'll chat again real soon. I loved it, Rich. Thanks so much for having me. Right appreciate back at it. you. Same to you. And say, say hi to everybody in Mount Laurel for me. I will do that. The uh, great uh, Greg Cosell of the fantastic NFL film, senior producer right here on The Rich Eisen Show. Catch The Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.